Hello, Pokemon Masters. Berkey Patobi here. And over the years, I have done so many different Pokemon theories. This video started as two completely separate theories that... It's cat hair. That's cat hair. This video started as two completely separate theories, but I realized they are one and the same. They are two to three parts of a bigger whole. So this video might feel a little discombobulated between the three sections, but I'll draw it all together with a conclusion at the end. Also, I didn't want to lose out on the cool live action intros that I did in some very cool places, but this is my one big theory of everything when it comes to AZ, the Draconids, and the life force of Pokemon. So sit back, relax. If you do sit forward, make sure it's to click the link in the description to head on over to my merch store before it closes down get things while you can stock is limited thank you all so much for watching and enjoy this pokemon theory of everything Hello, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Toby here, and I've made it down to a part of Japan that inspired Hoenn. We're somewhere between Rustbro and Fall Harbor, so maybe Meteor Falls. You might recognize these three from Attack on Titan, but the only Titan, the only giant I'm interested in right now is that of AZ, a man from the ancient past who's talked about by the Draconids that live in this very area. Dating back thousands of years, his history is interesting, and he knows all the secrets to infinity energy and a cursed past. There's someone in the Kalos region who has seen the passage of time as he has wandered all across the earth. AZ, a man of 3,000 years. He is giant and immortal when you meet him in Pokemon X and Y, but in his own time, 3,000 years ago, he was normal, a human, but he was a king. Some might say he was the king of multiple Pokemon regions. We'll talk about that shortly. First, what you must know is that he was the king at the time of the Ultimate War 3,000 years ago. This war was ended by the creation of the Ultimate Weapon, which used the life force of Xerneas, or Evelcal. It used the life energy of Pokemon to not only restore his fallen partner Pokemon Floette, but to end the war with a cataclysmic blast. In a great sadness, his Floette left him for 3,000 years, now immortal like he was, and he began to grow in size, likely as a result of being exposed to that energy. We know throughout Pokemon that changing size and shape as a result of excess energy is a thing. We see this with Gigantamax Pokemon, Totem Pokemon, Noble Pokemon, and Titan Pokemon. And AZ began to travel the world. He took with him a key that would be needed to activate the device should someone finds it, and the ultimate weapon was buried by AZ's younger brother. You could learn about this by some files in Lysander's lab, which are only available for a very short window of the game time. Lysander has these files as he is the descendant of AZ's younger brother, and ultimately is researching where the ultimate weapon has been hidden underneath Geosenge Town. However, very shortly after your battle with Lysander, the ultimate weapon has a false start and ends up blowing up itself. So who exactly was AZ? Where did he come from? How did he become king? And who was his younger brother. Well, there's evidence that AZ was from the Unova region. If we look to the Parfum Palace, which is inspired by the Palace of Versailles, we see this picture of what looks to be King Louis XIII. However, this is actually supposed to be a picture of AZ. This is one of AZ's palaces across Kalos. And in the garden, Reshiram and Zekrom. Parfum Palace was built 300 years ago. And to be clear, Reshiram and Zekrom have been stuck in the white and black stones for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years before this, which means their statues being here, they can only have been designed by someone who actually saw those Pokemon thousands of years prior. Sure enough, in Unova in the ancient times, there was two kings of Unova or two heroes, depending on the canon you're looking at. I believe in the time before AZ's giant war and the ultimate weapon fight, that AZ and his younger brother were the royalty of Unova. We actually know that one of the kings, at least, is buried in the tomb that is the Abyssal Ruins in the east of the region. In the west, there is the Relic Castle, and sure enough, in the Abyssal Ruins are the Relic items, along with 14 of the Arceus Plates. There are also inscriptions all over the world, and there's a lot of symbolism here, and there's a lot of reasons why and to do with character length, but it is theorized that the name of the person who was buried here, the royalty, was someone called Harmonia, which links them to Getsis. In fact, the crown that Getsis uses to crown N at the beginning of the game is the Relic Crown, and it's the same item that you can find here in the Abyssal Ruins. But there's something super interesting about the Abyssal Ruins. As I've mentioned already, there were 14 of the Arceus plates there as well. So AZ has a connection to Arceus? Why were they buried down there? Well, it could well be the case that the other Arceus plate, the one that's of course missing from those that are found in the Abyssal Ruins, the Fairy Plate, 
is the one that they left behind in the Galar region. That's because, yes, a further connection here, I believe that Aze and his brother before they were kings of Kalos and kings of Unova were the king heroes of the Galar region. Yes, those that we learn about from the darkest day. Not only is the relic crown the same shape as Zacian's crown, and that's about to be super important, but also, Pokemon are yet again in the space of just a couple of generations, referring back to this same mythos of two heroes. And what do you know, the darkest day was 3000 years ago. I suspect not the same day as the day the ultimate weapon fired. I actually believe that the story that's happening in Galar is when these two are quite young. The story starts that the two heroes on the darkest day wish upon a wishing star. Then the darkest day happens. Eternatus wakes up, but Eternatus has been around for much longer. We know that from Pokedex entries that it actually dates back to 20,000 years ago. Why did it wake up 3,000 years ago? The two heroes awaken Zacian and Zamazenta and fight against this Pokemon. They fight against the Darkest Day and are heralded as heroes. After the battle is done, they bathe in Sir Chester Baths, just north of where the fairy plate was buried. I believe that the Darkest Day happened, not as a result of the ultimate weapon firing, but instead as a result of the wish made by these children, a wish to go on a grand adventure, to wake up Eternatus. That might seem ridiculous to you, but actually it's not. I believe that the wishing star that they saw, which they literally describe it as such, is actually not one of the wishing stars that's the part of Eternatus' body, but the other kind of wishing star that we know that travels around the Pokemon world every thousand years. The Millennium Comet, as it's known in the animated series, or just Jirachi, as we know it in the games. Jirachi's signature move, after all, despite being a wish-fulfilling Pokemon, is that of Doom Desire. I suspect that the conflicting wishes of these two heroes resulted in an apocalypse and the saving of that apocalypse, the darkest day, which would only last for a day. And this is where our heroes of the time would learn everything they need to learn about giant felling from the plates of Arceus, which, as written, tell us that the power of fallen giants were infused within the plates. With these sacred tablets in hand and Zashkin and Zamazenta by their side, AZ and his brother were able to defeat the giant Pokemon on the darkest day and ultimately put Eternatus back to sleep. It is interesting to note that in Zashin and Zamazenta's Pokedex entry, they're described as the Fairy King's sword for Zashin and the Fighting Master's shield, suggesting that even though they were both ultimately crowned and both technically kings, one became the Fighting Master while the other ruled as king. Fairy King is also interesting because it's the fairy plate that was left behind south of Surchester. The rest of the plates were taken, of course, to Unova when they ultimately colonized. We also see this, by the way, with one of the chief Pokemon found by the Abyssal Ruins being Frillish, and Frillish being dressed like uh, noble dignitaries from, like, England and France, actually. Yet a further connection. That's besides the point. All of the relics of the Abyssal Ruins are also said to be 3,000 years old, dating them to the time of the Darkest Day and the ultimate weapon firing. And the connection might be drawn because the relic statue also looks a little bit like Deanne. Deancey is a Pokemon that's created from an irradiated carbink as a result of an exposure to a certain kind of energy or beam. It's possible that this beam was the very beam of the ultimate weapon 3,000 years ago. Carbink can commonly be found in the nearby mystical reflection cave, so it seems likely that Deancey is from here, especially as it's the only Kalos Pokemon that can mega evolve and its pink diamond structure matches that of the Anastar City Sundial. I'll digress. There's also a connection here to another mythical Pokemon, a Pokemon I don't think I've ever mentioned in any Pokemon theory ever before. That is the mythical Pokemon Meloetta. Another Pokemon somehow connected to, you know, over, it's possibly connected to this story. It knows a special move called Relic Song, and there are 32 relics in the Relic Castle. Meloetta's Relic Song would be the 33 relic, and 33 has some special symbolism around it. But the interesting part is this might be how Jirachi ties into the overall narrative. I didn't just get it out of nowhere. Yes, it's a wishing star, much like the wishing stars of the Galar region, but it is also said that Jirachi wakes up with a song, and according to an NPC talking about Meloetta, it seems to have lost its song when darkness covered the world, connecting all of these elements together. It is also true that the crown that was forged for AZ is that of his Pokemon, Zacian. Zacian and Zamazenta were hidden away in the rusted sword and the rusted shield and tucked away, uh, hidden out of sight. Ultimately, over time, the history was even changed from being two heroes to one hero, and we see that statue in Motostoke. It was the younger brother who shunned AZ and ultimately hid the ultimate weapon. 
and it was he who told his sons about it. It's interesting to know that in the Lysander Labs files, AZ was said to be the first king of Kalos, which means he is the one who settled the region and perhaps even established the Kalos region as we know it today. He took the plates to Yanova next, where he and his brother fought over truth and ideals with Reshiram and Zekrom. A palace was created in the Kalos region, where he went to then further expand his rule and ultimately the Great War happened. The ultimate weapon is fired and finally their history is at an end. The little brother helps AZ bury the weapon. AZ goes traveling with the key and is no longer a king. He is an immortal who becomes giant himself with all of this knowledge on how wishing stars works, on how the Arceus plates work, and of course ultimately one day he would bury his brother in the abyssal ruins with those very plates. And in the ruins, an old writing system. Not the oldest, however. Braille exists throughout the Pokemon world created by the Draconids. And also there is another type of writing, the unknown. Their ruins can be seen all over the Pokemon world, but not dating back that far. The Tenobi ruins are said to be around 1500 years old, which means that they were created during AZ's time. Additionally, with the existence of the Arceus plates, we can finally move on and talk about what all of this has to do with the Draconids. Part two, the Law Keepers, the Draconids. We know, of course, that the Arceus plates are tied to Arceus, and Arceus is tied to the unknown. It's not just a writing system, but also the fabric that seems to hold together the Pokemon world, as seen in the Darkrai movie, and of course, in the uh, Sinjo Ruins clip. We see Arceus use these unknown to create Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina in the Sinjo Ruins. We think that Ho-Oh used these Pokemon alongside to create Raikou, Entei, and Suicune, and perhaps even give long life to humans in Ecritique, who seem to remember the falling of the tower 150 years ago, something not too dissimilar to AZ's long life. In the manga, Team Rocket used the Arceus plates here to control Arceus. The mystery stage is described as Cynthia as also being a place that people use to show respect to Arceus, and they celebrate with music and dance. So this knowledge is passed down by people like Cynthia and the Kimono girls, who seem to know a lot about the lore of the Pokemon world. Between them, they know about Dialga and Palkia and Arceus. They know about Ho-Oh and Lugia. They're not too dissimilar from the Dragon Clan, the Draconid. The Dragon Clan also exists in the north side of the Johto region, and in the manga, we see that their leader has a Rayquaza upon their head. This this isn't an accident. There's also the embedded tower in Johto where Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza can be found. Markings on the floor of the embedded tower match those found in Sky Pillar. Sky Pillar and Cave of Origin sounding very similar to the Hall of Origin and Spear Pillar. Not only that, the Cave of Origin and the Sky Pillar are both guarded by Kimono Girls. As you can tell very quickly, all of these areas across Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh seem to be connected, and all of these clans of Kimono Girls and Dragon Tribes, whether that's Cynthia's family from Celestic Town, or perhaps the Draconids from Hoenn, all seem to be related. And this makes sense. We learn about the Draconids from Zinnia, who is herself a descendant of the original tribe that lived in what is now Meteor Falls, their home destroyed 2,000 years ago by that same meteorite shower that brings with it Jirachi. Since then, they've been nomadic, traveling across the Pokemon world and keeping Pokemon lore, so that makes sense for all of the aforementioned groups. We also know they traveled the world by way of sea. Civilog Town is right next to the Sky Pillar, but it's also next to the Braille Puzzle from which you can access the Regis. The Regis locked away eons ago by an ancient people. I suspect the Draconids. Perhaps a precursor to the unknown writing is the Braille writing, which can be found all across the Pokemon world. This would tie them directly to the people who built the Snowpoint Temple at the north end of Sinnoh, but perhaps again all the way back to Galar, where Regigigas can be found in the Crown Tundra deep underground. And temples to Regidrago and Regilecki can be unlocked. Meanwhile, across the world in the Alola region is the Seafolk Village. Again, another group of nomadic people who seem to have ended up on the island, the one island that is the home to the altar of sun and moon. They have their hands in pretty much every legend that happens across the Pokemon world. And when we think about how they traveled, whether by sea or by land, if they were traveling north from the Johto region through the Dragon's Den where that dragon clan was established, then they would have made their way up to Isui that way. I believe that these are the people from Sinjo that Kogita references in the old verse. At least we assume this is the writing of Kogita. She references the fact that Sinjo is kind of like the Hisui region. If people traveled north to Hisui from the Johto region, they would have passed through Sinjo. And in fact, this is what they describe as the birthplace of the Sinnoh people. Perhaps it was there that they learned about Arceus and decided to continue to pursue the lore and knowledge about it 
by traveling upwards. Kogita, of course, is settled in the ancient retreat, and she brings with her legendary Pokemon as well. She has Anamorous with her. One day, though, this will become Celestic Town, where there'll be a shrine not too dissimilar to the shrine that appears in the Unova region that looks just like this. This is connected to Landorus Thunderous Tornadus, but it's also very similar to the shrine that appears in the Ilix Forest that Celebi uses. So there are a lot of connections between all of these different peoples and clans. And of course, her descendant is Cynthia. And while Cynthia herself isn't technically a dragon Pokemon trainer specifically, her Pokemon are very interesting. She uses Lucario, which is a Pokemon of immense aura, Togekiss, which has its own ties to the Kimono Girls, uh, Spiritomb, which has its ties to the spirits of Pokemon, and then of course, Garchomp, her lead dragon Pokemon. Furthermore, in the Kalos region, she seems to have a cousin, which is Drasna, who has all dragon Pokemon. Pokemon and says that she comes from a Sinnoh village that respects old traditions. This is clearly, of course, talking about Celestica Town. And Celestica Town is, of course, where the Celestica people got their name. The Celestica people simply used to be Draconids, likely the very ones that built the Snowpoint Temple. Anyway, I digress. From what we know about the Draconids from Zinnia, we know that they have a sacred duty, and that is law keeping. Law keeping in relations to dragons, sure, but about all the legends of the Pokemon world. So the question becomes, when did they get this mission? How did it happen? And this is where I connect the two halves of the video together. Their culture and their entire tradition was given to them back in Meteor Falls by the one and only AZ. Just some points here for context, 2,000 years ago was when Rayquaza first appeared. 1,000 years ago was when the Draconids wished for it to mega evolve, which happened thanks to a meteorite. AZ was there, and he named it the Delta Pokemon. He likely traveled to Meteor Falls as a result of everything that went down with the ultimate weapon and the darkest day, likely to try and find Jirachi, the wishing star Pokemon, from which both so much great had happened, but also so much terrible. He found the Draconid people and taught them about so many of the Pokemon worlds, what we consider legends today, taught them of the Arceus Plates and likely warned them of the prophecy of a wishing star that will come by in yet another thousand years. Zinnia also knows of the Kalos War and she has a particular question for the player character about if they follow truth or ideals. A very pointed question from someone who also must know the lore. Of Unova. So Zinnia knows the lore of the Pokemon world, a responsibility handed down from her ancestors, likely given to them by AZ, the man who discovered all of this lore. But her job is not just to pass it down from herself to her descendants, it's also to safeguard this information from those who wish to use this knowledge for a great evil. Organizations like Aqua, Magma, and Flare, to be sure but also to protect it from the seemingly friendly corporations in the Pokemon world. Tired of running out of potions, TMs, and Pokeballs? This is where Devon is your best friend. Here at the Devon Corporation in Rustboro, we believe that the power of science is amazing. We're working on everything from Pokemon Dream Vision to the restoration of ancient Pokemon fossils. And we're bringing these incredible scientific advancements to you at your local Pokemart. The Pokeball is now just 200 Poke Dollars, and for every 10 you buy, you get yourself a Premier Ball all for free. Nowhere else in the Pokemon world can you get this kind of saving, so get on out there, Pokemon trainers, and catch them all. The Devon Corporation, a Pokemon trainer's best friend. Hey Pokemon Masters, Bunky Patobi here and I've made it to the Hoenn region. This is Fukuoka City in Japan, or as you might know it, Rustbro. You can already hear the brass instruments in the air. I'm here, of course, doing research on one of the big technological companies, Devon, responsible for Pokeballs, medicines, and of course, the Hoenn Pokedex. I've been researching many Pokemon out here, but what's more interesting than the Pokemon is the technology itself. Because this technology, Pokemon Masters, is nothing ordinary. It was made from something very dark and very sinister. I'm talking, of course, about Infinity Energy. Part 3, The Abuse of Infinity Energy, the Life Force of Pokemon. The most powerful force in all of the Hoenn region is by far the Devon Corporation. Their reach can be felt across the region, and they're responsible for Pokemon technologies like Silphco. They create the Pokeballs of that region. They are also involved in Fossil Resurrection, a powerful technology that also Silphco has access to. And one researcher in the facility talked about working on a technology to see into Pokemon's dreams, a technology realized in the Unova region. The company's president, Mr. Stone, tells you about these technologies and how they came about, how his grandfather learned to harness the life energy 
energy of Pokemon itself to fuel these technologies. His grandfather was able to discover the methods that AZ had learned and harness the power of what he trademarked as Infinity Energy. It's not actually called Infinity Energy, it is simply the life essence or life force of Pokemon. You may also know it as Aura, and you may see versions of it in the form of Gigantamaxing, Z Crystals, and of course, being used for Mega Evolution. But this is trademark Infinity Energy, and they use it on their submarines for deep sea exploration and on the rockets that they send up from the Moss Deep Space Center for deep space exploration. They can use this technology to open wormholes, as we see in the Delta episode, between realities. The power of Infinity Energy is truly infinite. And there was a time in Hoenn's history when this energy was being used for an incredibly important project. The Sea Marvel. The Sea Marvel, of course, shares its name with Marvel City, and also the New Marvel, which is nearby. The New Marvel was intended to be a giant underground bunker of many floors. However, the project was cancelled. While the player can access the top floor, in theory, there are 69 floors underground, but the project died in development. We can learn more about this at the Sea Marvel, which today is a nature preserve for Pokemon, but it's littered with letters and notes from the time that it was used to harness the energy of Pokemon. For example, the Sea the innocent 10 slogans for a cheerful and fun workplace. Say good morning very loudly. Don't bring your Pokemon to the workplace. A strange thing for a world that's focused on people and Pokemon walking together. Always arrive on time and always stay late. Lay your life on the line in safety checks. So you have to be safe and you have to dedicate yourself to the job. Take joint responsibility for teamwork and obey your superior's orders absolutely. So now there's a clear hierarchy. Maintain top quality. Give up your sanity. Worship and praise the founder. Beginning to sound like a cult. Don't expect time off before you retire. And finally, no need to think. Just work unceasingly. These are the slogans for a cheerful and fun workplace? This is not the kind of place that you would want to work if you had any other option. It seems that the goings on here were pretty shady. The need to not bring your Pokemon work and to lay your life on the line for safety checks implies that something dangerous is happening here as well. This is indicated by the presence of Spiritomb and an odd keystone. There's an apology note in the same room where Spiritomb can be captured from Professor Cosmo's dad. I am responsible for the loss of the odd keystone. Don't by the Orberg mine. Why did the people working here need a odd keystone? And what's this got to do with Devon? Well, you can find a special confidential Devon secret investigation report, which says that the development of the new energy turned out to be true. The energy uses Pokemon's bioenergy. It's called Infinity Energy. This seems to suggest that the Devon Corporation were committing corporate espionage. Assuming that CEOs of companies live a really long time, as Mr. Stone himself is already very old, we can assume that perhaps it was even even the case that his grandfather was alive and CEO for a long time, possibly even just skipping over his father. If so, this may be how his grandfather learned about Infinity Energy. It also mentions a report on Watson, who's deemed to be a traitor to the cause. Watson is a gym leader who is alive and well today, so this is recent history. In the manga, there was also a lore keeper before Zinnia, Aster, who died in a fire in the Embedded Tower protecting Rayquaza, and it was the Devon Corporation who were trying to capture this Pokemon for the Pokemon Association the main government in the Pokemon manga. Zinnia rescued her burnt cape from the fire and of course named her Wisma after her. And the odd keystone? Well, it's not just a nod to the fact that the Sea Marvel is on Route 108 and Spiritomb is the combination of 108 angry spirits, but it is in fact just that. It's the combination of spirits, lost spirits, perhaps angry because their life energy was used in the pursuit of technological discovery. This is why you don't bring your Pokemon to work at the Sea Marvel. As well as Cosmo's dad and Watson the traitor, there was also the man with no power. His notebook can be found in the Sea Marvel. It's an old hidebound notebook. And it says, The damage caused by the cancellation of the new Marvel project has been catastrophic. As a member of the management, much of the blame and the debts will fall upon me. But that will be little consolation to my employees working under me who will lose their livelihoods. Which does make sense. To work in this job, you'd have to be desperate. And so these people needed this job. He laments that he is a man with no power, protecting nature, Pokemon, and the environment. It's a great idea, a fine ideal to aspire to, and Watson is a great man for dreaming of it all. But cruel reality and the organization that I must try to preserve have dashed those dream. So this is to suggest that the Sea Marvel was originally designed to preserve and protect nature and Pokemon in the environment. 
That's what the sea marvel was trying to do for the new Marvel project. So in what way was it trying to protect the world? And Watson was the man that dreamt of it all? It seems that perhaps he had a great ideal, but as the man with no power says, cruel reality has set in. Perhaps Watson wanted to protect nature and Pokemon and the environment, but couldn't do so without going by unethical means and so pulled the plug on the project. So. What use would the Hoenn region have for a 69 floor underground bunker? And the answer of course is to save people and Pokemon in the case of a, an apocalyptic event. Hoenn is no stranger to apocalypses. Meteorites fell down 2000 years ago, destroying the home of the Draconid people. A thousand years ago, a meteorite came down and actually created the crater from which Sutopolis city was built out. And that's fine now, but meteorites hit the Hoenn region every thousand years. Another well-placed one could take out Sutopolis City, or perhaps any of the other central hubs in Hoenn. While the Moss Deep Space Center does act as a sort of orbital defense for the Hoenn region, protecting against meteorite showers with their various technologies. Technologies described as Zinnia as being abominable. It doesn't hurt to have a failsafe, a place for the people of Hoenn to go. And it's not just the threats above the sky that fall down, but no, the Hoenn region has Groudon and Kyogre that can warp and tear apart the land and sea. Too much water or too much land? An underground bunker could survive them all. And actually this ties into Team Aqua and Magma's plan. See, both Shelly and Tabitha, high ranking members of the organization, used to work for the Devon Corporation. And there are files in the basis for Team Aqua and Magma talking about primal energy, the same energy that Devon has turned into infinity energy, the trademark version. This primal energy used to flow regularly through Groudon and Kyogre and all Pokemon of old. The Azoth project was to have Archie or Maxi awaken Kyogre or Groudon and revert to the world to its primal state by using this energy. Possibly they learned about this energy from Shelby and Tabitha. But of course, not only standing in their way as you the hero of Hoenn, but also the Draconid people who are also familiar with this energy. They learnt about this energy from AZ, the name of which likely inspired the Azoth project. But none of this changes the fact that Pokeballs are still being produced today. And in the olden day, it seems that Pokeballs were produced by an Apricorn and special ore jetting up from the ground, also likely filled with the life energy of Pokemon in a more natural state. Meteorites and rocks are a big part of Pokemon and they can contain energies. Uh, that's also seen in like the red and blue orb, for example, but that's besides the point. To produce Pokeballs on a mass scale in the same way Devon does, in the way that Selfco does, or using this technology to see inside a Pokemon's dreams, the dream world being a literal other realm in the world of Pokemon, like ripping open a wormhole into a Pokemon's mind, much like how the wormhole technology uses infinity energy, we have to assume that infinity energy is still being used today. And just because the new and sea marvel projects have been shut down, we are much like the man with no power. We have to face the cruel reality of it all. The Pokeballs are fueled by infinity energy. The question is just how much of the Pokemon's life force do they take? I mentioned earlier and in plenty of other videos, how this energy displays itself in all sorts of different ways. There's aura and gigantamaxing, there's uh, Z crystals, and there's even noble Pokemon that seem to get the energy direct from Arceus itself. The more energy you add, the more the Pokemon can grow and transform. They become more powerful. It's thought that this energy is in fact the energy of evolution. It was irradiated at evolution stones that created the mega stones. The more energy you have, the more powerful the Pokemon can become. And this is confirmed pretty much with the Pokeball and the power that's inside, with the red light beam being pretty reminiscent of the red light beam that comes out from the max raid dens. It's an outpouring of energy that literally changes the Pokemon size, much like the Pokeballs. So it's possible that the technology harnesses this energy in a way that doesn't outright kill the Pokemon or hurt it too much, but it does take some level of energy and agency away from the Pokemon. And in fact, it could well be the case why these evil team leaders, despite the fact that they have Master Balls in the offices of Team Aqua and Magma and Team Galactic, don't use those Master Balls to catch the legendary Pokemon because it would take away some of their life essence and weaken them. In fact, Cyrus says exactly this. This is why he seeks out the Red Chain instead of using the Master Ball to catch Dialga or Palkia. So let's hope at the very least that these Pokeballs are being made at least somewhat ethically. So Pokemon Masters, you still sitting back and relaxing? Good. 
Here, let's draw these threads together. It's my belief that 3,000 years ago, two young hero children wished upon a wishing star that brought about the darkest day. A darkest day they were able to defeat with the help of Zashkin, Zamazenta, and lore about legendary Pokemon, including the Arceus Plates. Using their status and their new kingdom of the Galar region, they traveled over to the Unova region, where they became the hero kings of Unova, the youngest of which would eventually be buried in the Abyssal Ruins with the other Arceus Plate. The elder of the brothers, of course, AZ, also becoming the king of the Kalos region, basically king of the Pokemon world. However, he used everything he learned about legendary Pokemon and the life force of Pokemon, abused this technology, creating the ultimate weapon to help revive his flow at AZ. He knew about the lore of legends of the Pokemon world and traveled across the earth, ultimately passing this knowledge on to lore keepers called the Draconids. It was their role to be guardians of this knowledge, knowing that such abuse could result in the wiping out of possibly an entire Pokemon nation and killing many, many Pokemon. However, in the modern day, there are technological companies, Devon, and I suspect, as you've probably seen in other Pokemon theories of mine, the Self Corporation, that have tapped into this very energy for technological means. And so once again, we have to be careful how we use this technology. We must learn from AZ's mistake 3,000 years ago. And this is really only the tip of the Pokemon theory iceberg. Over the last couple of months and years, I've done so many Pokemon theories that tie into this. The ethics of his catching Pokemon wrong. Uh, the dream world, how does it work? Uh, why Togepi is extraordinary. The combination of the four legendary big boss Pokemon ultimately being parts of the Arceus. Sylphco and how they use teleportation. How Giovanni probably used teleportation and infinity energy slash the life force of Pokemon to open up wormholes into other realities for Team Rainbow Rocket. How this energy created the Blood Moon Ursa Luna in, in Kitakami. There, there is so many of my videos tying into this. This literally is the tip of the iceberg. So if you want to go anywhere deeper, uh, make sure to check out my whole Pokemon Pokemon epics or Pokemon theories playlist. The epics are the ones where there's usually like me doing cool live action stuff like in this video. The theories are the ones that are exactly the same just without that. Loads linked in the description. Enjoy the world of Pokemon theories and while you're down there in the description don't forget of course to click the link at the top of the description to head on over to my merch store and pick up some of my incredible merch. Tropical festivities is going to be gone forever soon so thank you all so much for watching and of course so hi Pokemon Masters. Hello there it's me Professor Oak. This video is over, so please choose another one wisely and quickly. Bye-bye. Thank you anyone who has ever contributed through Patreon, and especially the big patrons of this month, Lucas Gates, Anthony Lee, Charmander Anzibal, White Seed Deke, Pancake, Immortal Absol, and Jed Rubin. Thank you for your incredible support.